you've been serving in the assembly together for 15 years. You were running mates with uh, Senator Loretta Weinberg, who is now retiring. Uh, I'm curious how this all went down. Both of you felt obviously like you were the rightful successor. Uh, how did you make your decision to run? And what kind of conversation did you have with your assembly partner? Let me start with you, Valerie Huddle. Well, thank you, David, for hosting this forum tonight. It should be interesting, uh, especially since there's no time limit. So you might have to stop me since I can get chatty. Uh, but All right, you've frankly, gone long enough. Thank you. <laughs> it'll, frankly, it'll happen like that. <laughs> sorry, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. There, you know, <laughs> There's, there was always some chatter that the senator would be retiring. And uh, Gordon and I used to speak about this. And quite frankly, uh, we just never knew when she would. When she made the announcement, I immediately uh, wanted to run for the Senate. I felt that I could carry her progressive plat platform to the Senate. And the work that I've done the 15 years that I was in the legislature would give me um, uh, the the experience and resume to carry that so forward. Did you, did, did you then go to Gordon Johnson and say, listen, man, uh, I'm going to run for this seat? It was sort of an unspoken, uh, it was really unspoken. I think he knew I wanted, to see, wanted the seat. I saw him, Martin Luther King Day, and I said, Gordon, you know, we really never discussed this. He says, well, it just happened. So Gordon Johnson, how did, how did that work? I, uh, when I, we all knew that Loretta was going to be some time. And, uh, when she made the announcement, uh, when she made it official, uh, the first thing I did was to, uh, start reaching out to my county committee, principal chairs in, in the 37th district and start gaining or garnering support for my uh, campaign to replace Loretta Weinberg in the, in the state Senate. So. Uh, and, and in accordance with the uh, DCBC bylaws, so uh, and that's what I did. I went out to the uh, I went out to the uh, different towns, the thirteen towns in my uh, my district, and spoke to uh, most of the most of the MCs and and, and county committee people in those towns because they're the ones who be voting for me, and and most of them uh, supported me in in my endeavor. All right, so hey. Assemblyman Johnson has the backing of the party establishment, and with that comes favorable ballot position and access to resources. Uh, Assemblywoman, you've spoken out about that uh, during your campaign. You say it's unfair, but didn't you benefit from the, the same party apparatus and the same favorable ballot position for many years? Who, who's to say that Johnson didn't do the things necessary uh, by Democratic Party tradition and rules to win party support? You know, David Gordon likes to say that he reached out and I certainly did the same exact thing. I played by the rules. I tried to observe the process, but the minute, and, and actually Gordon, you said when she made it official, which means you, you sort of knew something way before she made it official. She made that announcement, uh, I guess the second week of January. And I waited, respectfully waited, uh, to make sure that when she made the announcement, I was ready to reach out. The minute I reached out, Gordon, you know this very well, I reached out to the chairs, I reached out to the chairman, and the first thing they said was, you should stay in the assembly. You know, this deal is already done. People told me that directly. So I tried to play by the rules. Unfortunately, Gordon, the rules were framed for you. And I mean that, Gordon, I think you understand that because I've been around the same time, and I am a loyal Democrat, I fought for the Party Democracy Act to make sure that it was transparent. But under this new chairman, apparently he had his thumb on the scale. When I called the municipal chairs, the deal was already done. So I don't know how you were way ahead of me. Let, let me interrupt you and, and just get um, Assemblyman Johnson in here. Is that how it went down? Was there some deal? How did you come to get all of this support from the county chairs and, and the county committees? How did that happen? Because I went to them. I went to the county chairs in the different towns in our 37th district, knocked on their doors, made You mean the municipal chairs, from... not the county chairs, the municipal chairs. I'm sorry, municipal chairs. Thank you. Because municipal I, I chairs. went to all of them as well. Yeah, let, let, let them talk, uh, Assembly. Okay. okay, Valerie. And uh, the municipal chairs and, and county committee people in the towns of my district knocked on doors, made phone calls, and uh, said I wanted to be 
uh, Loretta Weinberg's replacement in the state Senate. And uh, not, not everyone agreed. Not, not, not all the uh, county committee agreed. But we, I, I got in support, uh, went through the uh, process, a very open process that we have in Bergen County, was probably one of the most open process, uh, uh, procedures we have in, in the state of New Jersey, uh, what secret ballots, and um, and I got their support. There's a lawsuit uh, filed by some progressive groups and others looking for an end to the party line by redesigning the ballot. I, I want you to take a look at, this is the current ballot, right? This is uh, for the Democratic primary. The line is that first row on the left, all the candidates from the party, all the offices in one line. Everybody else over there on the other end of the ballot. Now, here's a sample from another state, right? Candidates for governor, one box, no party line. Candidates for senator, uh, for senator, another box, no line. Wouldn't that be more fair? And would you support redesigning the ballot like that? Let's uh, start with you, Assemblyman. I have to see more of that. Uh, I, I, I like the structure that we have. Uh, it is, uh, it have a, uh, a structured democratic campaign uh, allows for people who are not uh, able to finance their own campaigns to, to go out to their local people in their towns and, and go to their county committee people and say, listen, I want to be uh, the candidate uh, for but assembly, my town. If, if they don't be lying, they're all the way on the other end of, of the ballot. And there was a study done by a Rutgers professor which found that mm -hmm. in the last primary, the difference between you having the county line or not having the county line in terms of percentage of vote was 35%. So that's a built-in 35% uh, percent, uh, vote advantage there if you have the party line. Uh, so, all right, let's say you don't support uh, changing the, the, the ballot design. How about you, Assemblywoman Huddle? Do you support changing well, you know, the, David, the ballot design? David, you know, we are the only state in the union that has this system. And when you look at the ballot and the way it is designed, it is certainly not democratic for a primary. The unfortunate thing is Gordon and I are both Democrats. We are both part of the organization. There's not a fair opportunity for one to run against the organizational line. It simply isn't democratic. It disproportionately impacts candidates who primarily are women and people of color. I want to open up that transparency. I'm calling people and I'm asking them to vote for me. And they're saying, of course, we always vote Democratic. And then I have to go further and explain, but wait, I'm not on column one, I'm on column two. And I also just want to add, I had to go through hoops to make sure that I was able to get a column next or adjacent to the organizational line by running a 92 year old candidate for clerk because I needed a county candidate. Would you consider joining the suit? Right now it's too late to join the suit because it's already in litigation. If they file an, am an amicus brief, I certainly will.